dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Internet crowd there. Good morning, church. We're happy to be here in the house of prayer once again. As we are here to celebrate Father's Day, I want to draw on a passage of scripture. It's actually a familiar passage. I have cited it several times. We have heard dozens of sermons from this passage. However, we may think that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with fathers. So if you would bear with me, and we'll see where the Lord wants to take us this morning. I'm talking about the story of Joseph. To just catch us up in the context, Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Israel. Out of jealousy and envy, his brothers first tried to kill him by throwing him into a pit, later resorting to selling him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt where he has several ups and downs. In prison, he begins to use the gifts that God has given him for dreams and the interpretation of dreams. Through those gifts, God opens doors and elevates him to a high position in Egypt. He becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man, a sort of prime minister of Egypt. In the course of time, there is a great famine, a crisis, that affects the entire known world. And that brings his brothers into Egypt to get help. Now they are standing in front of their younger brother that they thought was long dead, gone, and forgotten. And that brings us to our text found in Genesis 45th chapter, reading from the New International Version. Verse 3, Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land. And for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh. Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. From that verse, God made me father to Pharaoh. 
I want to speak this morning from the subject, a God-made father. A God-made father. So here is Joseph reconciled to his brothers. And in his summation, his interpretation, chain of events that brought him to this place, he describes his relationship with Pharaoh, the most powerful man at that time. And he says that God made him a father figure to Pharaoh. Now, what does that mean? Well, it didn't mean that he was his boss. It didn't mean that he was his superior. Because being a father is not about being a boss. It's not about being superior. As we talk about fathers, if one was to go to scriptures to see examples, the do's and don'ts of fathers, you would have to stop by the life of King David. We all know King David. He's spoken of in many chapters and books of the Bible throughout the Old and New Testaments. We have a thorough account of his life from his youth to his dying day. At the end of his life, it gives a testimony of this man. We read about it in 2 Samuel 23. These are the last words of David. The inspired utterance of David, son of Jesse. The utterance of the man exalted by the Most High. The man anointed by the God of Jacob. The hero of Israel's songs. That's not a bad eulogy. And we certainly wouldn't challenge any of that. David was victorious over Goliath. He authored many of the Psalms that have become sacred scripture to us to this day. David was a fierce warrior king that expanded the kingdom of Israel further than it had ever been up until that time. But if you were to look at David as a father, you might be very, very disappointed. On his deathbed, he goes to pass the baton to his son Solomon. When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon, his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, act like a man. Every male at one time or another has heard that phrase. Act like a man. You may have heard it from your parent. You may have heard it from your wife, your girlfriend. But we have all heard it. It's a common refrain for men. Who can forget the scene? I don't know what to do with it. Act like a man. But what does that mean? How do you do that? And for David, 
He exhorts his son Solomon to act like a man. But David never showed him how to do that. And David certainly didn't demonstrate how to do that. Look at the life of David as a father. You recall a story of two of his children, Amnon and Tamar. It's a very ugly story, a horrific story. Find it in 2 Samuel 13 chapter. We pull out some of the verses there. In the course of time, Amnon, son of David, fell in love with Tamar, the beautiful sister of Absalom, son of David. Amnon became so obsessed with his sister, Tamar, that he made himself ill. She was a virgin, and it seemed impossible for him to do anything to her. Verse 11, but when she took it to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Then Ammon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Ammon said to her, get up and get out. A very disturbing story, a brother who rapes his half-sister. And David's response, when King David heard all this, he was furious. But that's it. We don't read that he did anything about it. He didn't do anything to Amnon. He didn't even do anything for his daughter. We don't read about any consequences. He got angry, but he didn't handle it. Well, someone else heard about it, and that was Absalom. And Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. So Absalom is going to respond where David failed to. The end result in the course of time, Absalom kills his brother Amnon. Well, that causes Absalom to be a fugitive and he flees Israel. He flees town. There were people in David's life that realized this is not good. We have a serious rift in the royal family. Heirs to the kingdom are now at each other's throats and there is division. So there were a couple of people who tried to move David toward reconciliation. In the 14th chapter, 2 Samuel, the king said to Joab, very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man, Absalom. But the king said, he must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. So there's no real reconciliation here. There's no real healing here. Absalom is shunned. David wants nothing to do with him. Well, Absalom's anger would fester and fortify. And he would lead a rebellion against his father, the king. 
that would lead to David literally being ran out of town in disgrace. That's just one story of David as a father. But Absalom, Amnon, and Tamar, not the only stories. David had another son by the name of Adonijah. Here we read, about that time, David's son Adonijah, whose mother was Hegeth, began boasting, I will make myself king. So he provided himself with chariots and charioteers and recruited 50 men to run in front of him. Now his father, King David, had never disciplined him at any time, even by asking, why are you doing that? Adonijah had been born next after Absalom, and he was very handsome. David never disciplined him. As a result, another rebellious son, who also ends up dead. In the law of Moses, he gave a commandment and expectations for when and if a king should ever take rule in Israel. In Deuteronomy, the king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. It's very clear. The king must not take many wives for himself. Well, that didn't stop David, who had at least eight wives. I say at least eight wives because those wives are named throughout the stories. It's likely that he had other wives that just never got named or mentioned. Solomon, of course, would have 700 wives following in his lustful father's footsteps. And while he was not supposed to have many wives and chose to have wives anyway, it didn't stop him from having an affair. He cheated, took Bathsheba, leading to his harsh rebuke from the prophet Nathan. And now here he is at his deathbed telling his son to act like a man. But he never showed him how. Didn't teach him how to be a man. Didn't exemplify what a man should be. Joseph here says God made him a father to Pharaoh. You would, we might understand if he said, I'm like a son to Pharaoh. I'm his right hand man. But no, he made him a father to Pharaoh. A very strange and unusual phraseology. Now, when we think about a father, and what that means, what that should mean. The scriptures use the phrase in many different ways. For one, we have God as our father. Malachi, do we not all have one father? Did not one God create us? So God is our true, ultimate father. Then we have our natural father. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. And so we all have natural, biological fathers. The Jews regarded Abraham as a father. And do not think 
you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. And by the way, Abraham as being the father of the Jews is not excluding Christian believers. We too can claim Abraham as our father. As Paul teaches, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Then there is what we commonly referred to as a spiritual father. Paul says that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, a careful reading of these verses, being a spiritual father, we often see that as limited to the person who brought you into the faith. Someone who shared the gospel with you and you got saved, we say, that's my spiritual father. And that may be the case, but a spiritual father is not just someone who brings you into the faith. No more is a father someone who contributes to your biology and having you born into the world. A father is someone who raises you, who works with you, who guides you. Paul says, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Proverbs, the second chapter, lays out, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commandments within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it, as for silver and search for it, as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. This passage here is one of those ifs and then statements. If you accept, if you call out, if you look, then you will find. What is it saying? Basically, if you accept my words, then you will find the knowledge of God. That brings us to the subject of a mentor. And I've always described a mentor as a shortcut. A mentor will teach you and show you not to have to go through what they went through. We've all heard the stories. When I was your age, I walked five miles to school in the snow without shoes, uphill, both ways. Well, a mentor will show you and teach you that you don't have to do it that way. If you hearken and listen to some of my guidance, I can spare you the hardships that I've gone through. Wisdom is the ability to anticipate a consequence. A bad consequence, it could be a good consequence. A mentor will teach them how to foresee what comes next. Wisdom is not just knowing how to solve a problem. 
Wisdom is knowing how to avoid a problem. This is what a mentor, a father, can and should do. Now, when we look at the nature of God, who He is, how He is, what's His characteristics, what's His essence, we find things like in Psalm 68. Sing, sing praises to God and to His name. Sing loud praises to Him who rides the clouds. His name is the Lord. Rejoice in His presence. Father to the fatherless. Defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families. He sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. He makes the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Our God is a father to fatherless. He places the lonely in families. This isn't just Old Testament stuff. We see it in the New Testament. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. Now, when we think of orphans, we think about those children that are homeless, living in orphanages with no parents. And for sure, that is a tragic reality. But we have somewhat modern day orphans, if you will. How many single moms are trying to raise kids for one reason or another and there's no father around? There's no mentor. Teenagers trying to struggle with life, trying to figure out things. They need mentors fathers to guide them, help them anticipate consequences, to show them how to avoid problems. Now, when we look at the life and the ministry of Jesus, he comes born as a child, and with the exception of a passage in Luke at the time when he was 12 years old, we don't hear anything about his life growing up. Jesus steps on the scene at the age of 30, and his ministry begins at his baptism. And why did Jesus come? Well, of course, he came to sacrifice himself as the perfect sacrifice to pay for our sins. But that's not something that had to take three years. He could have did that the same week of his baptism. If we're talking about dying for your sins, he was fit and qualified to do it right at that point. So what were those three years all about? And we say, well, he did all of his teachings to the masses. And that's true, without a doubt. But when he called to take the gospel, he didn't say, teach what you heard me teach. He told them to preach the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And that's what we see the apostles preaching. What am I saying? You know, Jesus said, if a man slaps you, turn the other cheek. That's priceless. But that's not going to save you. It's the death, burial, and resurrection that has the power of salvation. And so we see the apostles not quoting the parables of Jesus, not quoting the sayings and teachings of Jesus, but proclaiming his death, 
burial, and resurrection. So we go back. Why did it take three years? Well, I would suggest to you that those three years was being a mentor. It was about being with those 12 men and training them, being a father figure to them, imparting to them the wisdom, insights, and powers. The testimony is clear. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. What Jesus did with those handful of men is what got us here today. It's what took the gospel around the world. The price, the value of a mentor. The psalmist would proclaim, even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. This is what Paul was to so many in the church. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. To the Philippians, he says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. His letter to Timothy and Titus were letters of mentoring to his protégés. Titus 2, teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Verse 6, in the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. That's what being a spiritual father is about. That's what being a mentor is about. Joseph was a father figure to Pharaoh. There are those of us, maybe our children are grown and gone. There are those of us, we didn't have a father around at all. Some of us may have never had any children at all. So, Trying to find relevancy, particular relevancy in Father's Day. If you are a man of God, whether you ever had children, biological children, whether they are here or grown and moved on, whether you have failed in the past, if you are a man of God, you can be a mentor today. That's our opportunity to make a difference, to help others and guide them and give them wisdom. There's a place for every man of God to be a mentor, to be a God-made father, to help the younger people, to help those who are lonely, to help those who need guidance and lead them and help them share their burdens, pass on your wisdom, be a God-made father. He doesn't fight crime or wear a 
cape He doesn't read minds or levitate But every time my world needs saving He's my superman Some folks don't believe in heroes Cause they haven't met my dad Break. 